I want to welcome everybody. This is my very first video presentation and today we're going to be discussing emotional control, improving your poker game by keeping your cool. Since this is my very first video, I thought it would make sense to introduce myself. Um, for those of you who are frequent visitors to 2 Plus 2, I am Sergeant RJ on that site. Some of you would know me as a moderator of news, views, and gossip. But more germane to this particular topic, um, I have a master's degree in counseling psychology with, um, I mean, I'm nearing completion of my PhD in counseling. All I have to do is finish my dissertation. And I've worked with dozens of clients over the years in various internship settings and things of that nature. Now, why am I basically telling you this thinly veiled brag? Well, because this is a presentation about emotional control, it's a psychological topic, so my background in psychology will give you some idea where I'm coming from and also allow you to personally judge whether or not I'm a person who can speak to this topic intelligently and whether or not you think you should pay any attention to me. On my poker background, I've been playing for about three and a half years. I'd consider myself a serious recreational player, but it's never been my livelihood. And I mostly played MTTs and sit and goes, uh, STT sit and goes, um, back when I was playing still on Poker Stars, I am an American, so I'm not playing online right now. Um, and some no limit cash mixed in as well, M almost always live and no higher than 2.5. Goals for this particular training are to understand why emotional control is impo an, an important skill in poker, learn to identify specific things that lead to loss of an emotional control for you, gain preliminary tools for identifying when you are losing control and how to regain it, and finally to explore some broader applications for emotional control in your overall life. First, however, I think we really need to address the question of emotional control, is it even possible? Because if it's not possible, then obviously I shouldn't even be talking about this and you shouldn't have to worry about it. Now, have you ever heard somebody say, or have you ever said to yourself, people can't control their emotions? Um, something happens, I got angry, that's completely natural, I didn't have any control over it. Of course, I'm going to get angry there, anybody would get angry there. This isn't entirely correct. Feelings in certain situations are instinctual. Um, for example, fight, fight or flight. If you're, you feel like your life is in danger, you're going to have two competing drives, which are to stay and fight or to run away and flee. Um, and that can be considered an instinctual emotional reaction. However... The fact is, is that anybody who is willing to put in the amount of work necessary can learn to gain a large measure of control over their emotions. And that's what we're going to talk about in this presentation today. The key to this, to being able to control your emotions, is to recognize and accept that your emotions are not always an automatic reflex. Um, your thoughts and your attitudes play an enormous role in how you feel. And we're going to get into that more in depth in this presentation. Um, if you aren't willing to accept that, if you aren't willing to accept that you have some control over your emotions, then really this entire presentation is going to be pretty worthless for you. If you do, however, believe me when I say that you can learn to gain some control of your emotions, that's what this presentation is going to be about, and we're going to talk about ways that you can do that. If you adjust your thoughts and your beliefs and your outlook and your attitude in specific situations, you will, by default, change your emotional reactions to those specific situations as well. Here's a kind of a very basic poker example. You know, player A, player B are both playing heads up versus one villain, villain Z. Both players get in all in pre-flop versus this villain. They both have king, king. He has ace, rag. On both tables, this villain spikes the ace. Now, one of these players tells himself, I'm unlucky. Uh, this shouldn't have happened to me, I should have won that hand, this is so unfair, and he becomes despondent over this loss. The other player, player B, tells himself this is expected variance, the guy's going to win you know, approximately 29% of the time, this was one of those 29%, and shrugs it off. This is obviously a very basic example, but it's one that happens all the time as well, and what it sort of demonstrates is that emotions are not automatic. They, are caused, they aren't caused by the external event, but instead by the individual's reaction to and mindset about the event. If specific reactions could be said to cause, always cause an emotion, then everybody would experience the same emotion in response to that event. If 
getting sucked down on the river causes anger then every time somebody got sucked out on then the person who lost the hand should get angry and i think you know we've all seen proof to the fact that that's not true uh in the events okay fine so it's possible to control emotions but honestly why should i care why should i bother what is poker poker is a game where you are trying to improve your edge by making mathematically correct and plus EV decisions. Anything that clouds your ability to make plus EV decisions can negatively impact your game. Now I want to just preface all this by saying that there's nothing wrong per se with having or expressing your emotions, nor is any one particular emotion bad. Anger isn't bad. Uh, sadness isn't bad. Disappointment None of those are bad emotions. However, all emotions invariably result in being a block to the decision-making process. They make decision-making slower and more difficult and more likely to be focused on an emotional decision rather than focus in, focusing on a rationally correct decision. Now, the more intense and prolonged the emotion, the more significant the disruption to the rational decision-making process. And I think that makes intuitively makes a lot of sense. If you're very mildly irritated when your king king gets sucked out on by ace rag, you know, you experience a flash of irritation that lasts about five seconds, then you're not going to experience any sort of significant disruption in your ability to make correct decisions. You might be irritated for the very start of the next hand, and that's it. However, if you go on tilt and you end up getting really pissed off, then that will affect your ability to make rational decisions for much longer and by default will, will therefore affect more hands that you play and if you're still on tilt. What this boils down to is that poker is a game where optimal play is the result of making rational decisions. Therefore, anything that clouds the decision-making process must, by default, result in less optimal play. Again, very basic poker example. Have you ever called a preflop raise out of position and or with a suboptimal holding in order to get back at a player who was sucked out on you? Kind of, we would kind of think of that as sort of a natural thing to want to do, but it's a very small example of how an emotion, which is irritation at having lost a hand that you should have won, can result in a player making a negative EV decision. So the conclusion of these previous two little modules is that avoiding emotional tilt and learning tools to regain control when necessary will improve your poker game by aiding in rational decision making. If you can avoid getting emotional or if you can regain control of your emotions much more quickly than your opponent when you do experience some minor tilt, you will have an advantage because you will be able to get back to making rational plus EV decisions more quickly than other people in the game. So, this begs the question, what results in tilt for you personally or loss of emotional control? Some of you might already know what results in you losing emotional control while you're playing. And for those of you, I say congratulations. You're probably ahead of about 75 to 80% of the players out there. I would also maybe sort of caution you to think uh, or to keep an open mind about the fact that there might be other things that cause you to tilt that are less apparent to you right now. But if you have a pretty good idea of what causes you to start to get really frustrated while you're playing, you're ahead of the game. If you don't know what things you know, set you up for tilt, set you up for losing your emotional control. That's what we're going to talk about in this next section. And don't worry about it. It's really not that hard to figure out most of the time. So these are the basic steps. First of all, you have to be honest about what you're feeling when you're feeling it. This is kind of a really counterintuitive thing for a lot of people to, to do. So let's talk about this a little bit. It takes a certain amount of mental energy and a certain amount of concentration to be able to monitor your internal state, what you're thinking and what you're feeling at any given time. If you're not willing to do that, and more importantly, if you're not willing to be honest about what you're experiencing when you're doing it, then keeping or regaining emotional control is going to be much more difficult. If you, for example, 12 table, and that is 
the uppermost limit of your mental energy if while you're 12 tabling you pretty much have no mental energy or and no extra concentration to do anything other than play those 12 tables then you're not going to be able to monitor yourself you're not going to be able to take a second every now and then and go okay what am i feeling right now am am i starting to get angry am i starting to get irritated am i starting to get tired am i starting to get any of those things if you're so busy or if you're at the upper limit of your mental concentration just in what you're doing and what you're in you're playing you're not going to have any sort of extra mental energy or mental concentration to focus on yourself and figure out where your lack of emotional control comes in so if you know that you're one of those people you might actually want to cut out a couple tables if you want to figure out what is more likely to cause you personally to tilt and lose emotional control because if you're not monitoring yourself if you're not willing to honestly look at yourself and say this is what I'm feeling and thinking right now and be honest with yourself then you're not going to be able to regain control over your tilt once you've identified that you're starting to tilt and for some people you might not be able to identify this until you're already pretty much in full-blown loss of emotional control it's important to stop and examine what has just happened in the immediate past that triggered this reaction the important thing here though is that you have to be specific what is it about what just happened that provoked an emotional response and we're getting going to get into that into some depth but it's not as basic as well of course I'm pissed off because that donk just caught his ace against my queens it's not that simple if it were then most people would probably be able to control their tilt a lot more with a lot more capability what you need to understand is that your emotional responses are most frequently provoked by unreasonable or irrational thoughts and assumptions about a specific event when what really happens doesn't conform to what we want to happen or what we think should happen or what we expect to happen then an emotional response tends to be more likely than the alternative which is to actually sit down and think to ourselves this is what happened this is what I thought was going to happen was what I thought was going to happen actually rational or did I have some sort of you know unreasonable expectations about what should happen in this particular situation now this can actually best be summed up I'm gonna borrow from a fellow 2 plus tour who posted in the mortar and brick forum and he said anger comes from expectation clashing with reality and I think there's a lot of truth in that statement and I think also think you can substitute a couple other emotions in there for anger disappointment comes from expectations clashing with reality depression comes from expectation clashing with reality and irritation comes from expectation clashing with reality but the takeaway message from this is that our emotions are in this case caused by our expectation not by reality if what we expected actually conforms to what what ended up happening then we wouldn't get pissed off about it again another very basic poker example you got it all in preflop with king kings somebody calls you with ace queen you personally consider this to be a very large or important pot unfortunately an ace comes on the river your opponent takes the pot rationally there is nothing remarkable about this hand you got your money in as a 71 and a half percent favorite which anybody who's been playing poker for more than five minutes would tell you you should be thrilled to get it in with that kind of an expectation you want to get your money in as a significant favorite however you need to bear in mind that your opponent will win just under three out of every ten times this happened to be one of those times stop and think about that for a moment your opponent will win almost 30 percent of the time if you get it in preflop ace or I'm sorry king king versus ace queen offsuit however most people tend to focus on the fact that they should win 70 percent of the time as, a, as opposed to the fact that they should lose 30 percent of the time and if you stop and think about this in this particular respect there is no luck in poker a one outer will hit a specific percentage of the time the fact that it happened to you in this particular spot it's is neither lucky for your opponent nor unlucky for you it doesn't mean anything about whether the poker guys hate you or not or whether or not your opponent is a giant luck sack it's just variance 
So all of this comes down to where you focus your attention. Do you focus your attention on what you can control or do you focus your attention on what you can't control? Because in poker, you cannot control the outcome of the hand. Everybody knows this. If you get it all in on the flop when you've hit a set and your opponent has a flush draw, you can't control whether or not that flush draw is going to hit. Sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. In the long term, it should hit with the same percentage of the mathematical expectation that it should hit. What you can do is control how you mentally approach the game and the situation and focus on rational decision making, getting it in with a positive expectation. If you are mentally expecting to win with your in the king king versus ace queen example, you're going to have your expectations quashed almost 30% of the time, which potentially leads to disappointment, anger, being pissed off, loss of emotional control as you sit there and kind of berate your opponent for being a luck sack and a donk. If instead you focus on the aspect of the game that you can control, which is making plus EV decisions and getting it in good and focusing on that part of your game, then the result of the hand is immaterial. You already won the hand by making a plus EV decision. Now, in psychobabble terms, we do have a term for this, and it's called reframing. What that means is that you're choosing to focus on this part of the situation and label it in this way as opposed to focusing on another part of the situation and labeling it another part of the way. Um, and we're, as we get into a couple more examples and we talk a little bit more, I'll get a little bit more in depth into what it means to reframe your, your mental expectations about specific events. So we talked about, is emotional control something you should focus on? How you can identify in yourself that you are starting to lose control? But obviously, if you identify that, then an important consideration is, how do I regain control once I realize I'm starting to lose it? This is one of the more difficult things to speak about in a, in a general kind of way because methods for regaining emotional control can, very, can differ significantly from, very, from person to person. Broadly speaking, however, one of the most effective ways in both regaining control and preventing future, future loss of control is to identify and dispute the underlying thoughts that cause your expectations to clash with reality. What that means is is that if you can learn to reframe, if you can learn to identify the thoughts that you have that are causing your expectations to clash with reality, and if you can find the parts of your thought process that are sort of unreasonable or irrational and challenge those thoughts and change those thoughts, then you are much more likely to be able to regain control quickly and prevent future loss of emotional control when you find yourself in those situations. Otherwise, it's if you realize that you've really kind of lost all of your emotional control, if you're really pissed off, if you're really angry, if you're starting to get really frustrated or depressed, I'm sorry, or depressed, then you really need to figure out what works best for you to regain your focus or a sense of calm. And this can vary wildly from person to person. Some people might need to take a break. You know, even if you had said that you were going to play for four hours, you hit a really difficult situation and you end up taking a break at two hours instead. Um, some people might find it sort of being able to clear their mind if they go out and exercise. Some people find it beneficial to talk to somebody, talk through the hand, talk through what happened, and find that that helps, helps them gain a different perspective on the hand. You're going to kind of need to reach back into your own life and think about times when you've been pissed off before and what helped you calm down and apply that when you figure out that you're losing emotional control in the present or the future. Because I can't tell you in a PowerPoint presentation oh, okay, you, you've gone on tilt, well, go take a walk around the block and you'll be fine. That might work for player A, but it's not going to work for player B. So you need to figure out sort of on an individual level what helps you calm down. Then, once you're calm enough to think rationally again, you need to figure out what your thought process was that helped contribute to your emotional reaction, to your loss of emotional control. Again, poker example. You have ace-ace, 
and you bet an optimal, optimal amount to gain value on all streets, but your opponent, who has an underpair, sticks around until the river and spikes his set. Now, this is kind of a thought exercise for you to do if you're if you want to gain some more insight into what puts you on tilt and how you can go about regaining emotional control. So actually stop and think about this type of hand or pick a hand history from a session that you had where you recognize you were starting to get really pissed off. And once you're calm again or once your session is over, once you have some time to stop and think and study, go back and revisit that hand history or an example like this and really sit down and think about the entire situation from beginning to end. What were you thinking about at each stage? What did you think about when you looked down at ace-ace? Did you automatically think to yourself, oh wow, I'm gonna win this hand? Because that's kind of an unreasonable expectation. Aces don't win every time. They win, what, about 78 to 81 percent of the time versus a single player once you get to the flop or beyond. And I'm talking about no limit hold'em, not like say Omaha or Raz or something like that. But if you, every time you look down at ace-ace and you say, oh great, I'm going to win this hand and I'm going to win a big hand, that's not really a reasonable expectation, is it? So think about the situation from front to back. Think about the hand all the way through and what you were thinking and feeling about your hand, about your decisions, and about the villain at every point in the process and see if you can identify if there are any unrealistic assumptions, thoughts, beliefs based on what you know about poker and whether or not some of these unrealistic thoughts and beliefs are what led you to feel frustrated or disappointed. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about the application of this outside of poker. And I found this little Dilbert cartoon, which I really like. It says, we're no longer using the term work-life balance because it implies that your life is important. Um, obviously, I think that everybody's life is important and that you can take lessons that you learn in poker and apply them outside to your life. Um, and something like having control of your emotions and being able to make plus EV decisions for your life, obviously I think that would be a tool that's, if you can learn it and apply it in poker, it would be beneficial if you could apply it in other parts of your life as well. So the principle that you are more likely to experience overwhelming emotions when your expectations clash with reality holds true outside of poker as well. And I think that's sort of a very obvious statement. Um, I didn't learn psychobabble terms like reframing by doing poker. So obviously, in sort of the psychological realm, we talk about unrealistic expectations and how they impact your life and how they impact your emotions in all walks of life. And I think it's also important to point out that everybody, everybody in the world holds some irrational thoughts or expectations about their world, about their particular place in the world. And when they are challenged or disappointed by reality, emotional distress often follows. So what this means is that if you decide to focus on maintaining your emotional control and focus on identifying your irrational thoughts and beliefs and when when you uncover some because if you're serious about this you will uncover some it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you or that you should somehow be able to ma wave a magic wand and get away and do away with your irrational thoughts everybody has them everybody carries some unreasonable expectations or beliefs about their world and the more of them you have the more likely you are to be emotionally volatile because the more likely it is that reality is going to clash with what you expect or hope or believe reality should look like. So there's nothing wrong with you if you have some irrational thoughts or beliefs. Everybody has them. You can identify what puts you on life tilt via the same process that you identify what puts you on poker tilt. If you recognize certain situations in your life tend to make you depressed or frustrated or angry or whatever, you again, if you can monitor your internal thoughts, you can figure out when you're getting angry and then try sit down and try to figure out what about what just happened pissed me off and what thoughts do I have about what happened that might be contributing to my growing loss of emotional control. I want to talk a bit about the fact that this is not an easy thing to do. 
you know, I'm talking about monitoring your internal thoughts and emotions. And there's a psychobabble term, obviously, for that too. It's called internal dialogue. Everybody, at pretty much all the time, is carrying on some sort of internal conversation with themselves. But most people aren't really aware of what they're thinking and feeling in their own head at any given moment. We don't usually stop and think about how we think. We just assume that it's automatic and go about our day. So this is not an easy thing to do. It's sort of a very uncomfortable situation at first to try to sit down and identify why do I think what I think? What are my beliefs about this that cause me to think this? Is there anything irrational about those beliefs? I, monitoring your own internal dialogue and trying to identify or challenge the things in your own head that are kind of irrational isn't a natural thing for us to do. It is, however, possible. It just takes a lot of work. So if you want to do this, you have to recognize that just like improving your poker game, there's no magic wand. Nobody is going to be able to wave you know, a, a stick and say, hey, I've got this irrational thought. I figured it out in five minutes and now I've, now I've done away with it. Now I'm not going to tilt anymore. It doesn't work like that. This is a process that would involve you monitoring your internal dialogue often enough to be able to identify your irrational thoughts and then be willing to actually challenge yourself when you think them. So why would you bother to go about actually doing that kind of an amount of work? Well, we already talked about how it would benefit your poker game by enabling you to consistently make more rational decision making. But the other positive about this is that it actually addresses the root cause of your lack of emotional control rather than the symptom. Um, if you, all you do when you get angry is you go do something that makes you happy, okay, that's going to solve the fact that you're angry in this moment, but it's not going to prevent you from getting angry in the future. If you go to the doctor, with a broken leg and you're kind of screaming because you're in pain and they give you opiates for the pain, that's going to address the fact that you're in pain. But it's not going to fix the underlying cause of the pain, which is that you have a broken leg. So if they don't set the leg, you're just going to keep being in pain. That's kind of the same thing here. If you can address the underlying root cause of your what makes you go on tilt, of what makes you lose emotional control, then you're going to gain in the future by reducing the amount of time, the, or by reducing the number of times that you actually do lose emotional control. You're not just treating the symptom, you're actually treating the illness for lack of a better word. And again, I want to point out that there's no such thing as a bad emotion. I don't mean that your emotions are an illness, but you know, I use that example, so just to follow through on it. Real life example. You've been dating this girl for a few months, but the two of you have just called it off. You experience a fairly significant amount of depression and self-doubt as a result. Now, obviously, if you care about somebody, then losing your relationship with that person would naturally be expected to cause some sadness, maybe some depression. But there are people who, in a situation like this, are going to exacerbate their depression and their disappointment by, by thinking things like, you know, gee, I must be pretty worthless or hopeless you know, if she dumped me, or, you know, she was the only one and I'm never going to find anybody like her. Those are the type of irrational or unreasonable expectations about the world that if you can identify them and challenge them, they are, you can change them over time and therefore gain a certain amount of control over your emotional state. So, in conclusion... What did we learn in the course of this PowerPoint presentation? We learned that it is possible to gain a certain measure of control of your emotions. We learned that avoiding emotional tilt and regaining it quickly will improve your poker game by removing obstacles to the rational decision-making process. We went over some ways that can help you identify what puts you on tilt, both in poker and in life, and talked about why challenging your thoughts or beliefs may help you be able to regain your emotional control more quickly and also help prevent tilt in the future. And again, we did talk about how that can be applied to other parts of your life as well. So this has been Sergeant RJ discussing emotional control. I want to thank you all for listening and 
I hope to do future videos on how psychology and uh, and the mental world can help impact your poker game and your life positively in the future.